Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to Ecology Live. This is a new series of online talks from the British Ecological Society. I'm Mark Haddad of the University of Toronto. I'm also chair of the BS's newest publishing initiative, Applied Ecology Resources, and editor-in-chief of its associated open access journal, uh, Ecological Solutions and Evidence. If you're not aware of the British Ecological Society, we're the biggest scientific society for ecologists in Europe with a membership of over 6,000 people in over 120 countries around the world. We're broadcasting these free talks during the coronavirus lockdown period. So there's still a great opportunity to hear about the latest research from top speakers, even while we're all working from home. There have now been uh, over 3,000 registrations for this series from people all over the world with many hundreds watching right now. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us and to thank the wonderful BES staff for making this all possible. I'll shortly hand over to our speaker, Holly Jones, uh, from the Northern Illinois University, uh, who's giving today's seminar. Holly is also lead editor with Ecological Solutions and Evidence. But first, let me quickly explain the format. There'll be a short question and answer period after the 25 minute talk from Holly. Please do submit your questions during the talk using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. There's no need to wait till the end of the talk. Uh, your questions can be named or anonymous. You can select. We'll then pick a couple of questions to ask our speaker at the end of the session. Also, we are recording this talk and we'll post the video to YouTube afterwards. Without waiting any longer, let me introduce today's speaker, Holly Jones, who will tell us all about the impacts of bison on prairie plants and animals in restoration. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mark, for that lovely introduction. Um, hang on one second. Okay. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today about um, the work that my team and I has been, have been doing on how bison reintroduction is impacting prairie plants and animals. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump into it. Um, hang on one second, I think I have to... I know I stopped sharing, don't panic. Let me try again. Okay, now I think it'll work, yep, okay. So um, I wanna start just by emphasizing that the work I'm about to present to you, though I'm presenting it solely, is really a, a huge team effort. I have a lot of collaborators and the engines of the research I'm about to present are a graduate and undergraduate students. So I would like to start by thanking those people and also thanking all the funders, the stewards at the restoration site and the managers at the restoration site that we work in. And that restoration site is called Nachusa Grasslands, and it comes from some humble beginnings. So I'm gonna start by um, telling you a little bit of a story about how it was founded. Um, it was founded when two conservationists, a husband and wife team called Doug and Dot Wade, were driving through the area that's now Nachusa, but then was agricultural corn and soybeans growing. And they were driving by with their windows rolled down and they heard this sound. And as strong natural historians, they both knew that that call was the call of the upland sandpiper. And because they heard the call of the upland sandpiper, they knew there must be some prairie around because the upland sandpiper only hangs out in relatively short grass prairie. So they jumped out of the car, went bushwhacking through some corn and beans and found this prairie remnant site. Um, and remnants are prairies that have never before been plowed. And they saw some really cool prairie plants and they told the people that they knew at the Nature Conservancy that this site was really worthy of, of conservation. And as the lore goes, about 15 minutes before the area that's now the main unit of Nachusa was set to be put on the auction block for housing developments um, with street names called Big Blue Stem and Little Blue Stem, which are prairie grasses, the Nature Conservancy bought up the whole lot and that's how Nachusa grasslands started in 1986. And every year since then, they've been buying up land around that core main unit and then restoring it from agricultural back to prairie. 
And prairies are super important. And I want to um, just tell you a little bit about why they're important, but I also want to get some sort of uh, uh, language straight. So in North America we call grasslands prairies, whereas in other places they're called cerrado or steppe or savannas. Um, here in North America prairies are really important and all throughout the globe prairies are really important. They give people a whole host of ecosystem services. The type of prairie that I work in is called tall grass prairie and it is really tall. So taller than me, which I know isn't saying much, but really tall grasses. But the coolest part, I think, is actually what they're doing beneath the ground. So the root systems, as shown in one of these pictures here, are even deeper than the grasses and plants are tall. And so what that means is there's a pretty reliable source of carbon storage beneath the ground in these prairie grasslands. It also means they can soak up flood water and rainwater and filter toxins really well. And prairies are also a host to a, a wide variety of biodiversity, which is important for pollinating crops and also for giving us beautiful places to walk around in. Despite prairie's importance to people, they're one of the world's most endangered ecosystems. Here's a map of the historical extent of tall grass prairie in the lighter shade and then what's left is in the darker green. And so you can see Illinois there along Lake Michigan and you can see that basically there, there's not enough prairie left in Illinois to make the map, which is pretty ironic because we're the prairie state, we've lost 99.99% of our prairie, which is pretty depressing. But the good news is there are a ton of people, managers, volunteers, who are trying to reverse all that. And one of the places that they're doing that is where I work at Natusa Grasslands. So a bunch of managers and volunteers um, have been working to, to restore prairie at Natusa grasslands and in other places. And it really is a world-class prairie restoration. I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but they're known for their high diversity restorations and people from all around this area come to see the methods that they use to try to implement them. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not easy work to restore a prairie. It goes something like this. Um, it starts as a, a row crop field, and then the year they plant the prairie seeds, it looks like this. So these are trucks that are harrowing in seeds shot from our drone. Um, and basically they plant around 150 to 200 native prairie plant species per planting. Um, but the work's not done after that. There's a whole host of management that needs to, to happen so that prairies can thrive in this area. One of the most important things is to reinstate historical disturbance regimes. So, so fire is one, one such regime. Um, back in, uh, in the day, indigenous Native Americans uh, groups would set fire to the land to make it easier to live and hunt. And also natural fires would have been set through thunderstorms. Um, but today, managers put prescribed fire on the landscape and fire is really critical to maintain prairies. So it keeps down the woody vegetation that would otherwise turn prairies into forests, but it also keeps down invasive species that aren't necessarily adapted to the fire life. So fire is really important, but it also has this side effect of, of really giving the advantage even more to the grasses in the plant community. So grasses are competitively dominant over the forb community. Um, and fire, uh, fire increases that competitive dominance of grasses. So the more we burn at a prairie, um, the more grass dominated the plant community becomes and the less diverse it becomes. And when you juxtapose that against the um, time since restoration, grasses become even more dominant as work from my group has shown. So on the y-axis here, we have plant species richness and on the x-axis we have um, restoration age and years. And what you can see is the decline in plant species richness. And I, I have some pictures here just to give you a sense of what this looks like on the ground. The first couple of years of restoration are a lot of agricultural weeds, um, but then the prairie plants outcompete those agricultural weeds and you have this sort of dream 10 to 15 years post restoration where you have tons of plant diversity and then grasses start to dominate in as succession happens but also as those those impacts of fire kick in and we do see a higher grass to forb ratio with restoration age and again this just indicates that grasses are sort of starting to dominate and diversity is getting lower so there's another historical disturbance regime that can potentially counteract those effects and bring the diversity back to the plant community and that's um, the, the uh, grazing regimes. So these big mega herbivores that used to total in, 40, in the numbers of 40 to 60 million um, all over North America used to be really important grazers and likely maintained the plant diversity um, that a lot of restoration managers are looking for. 
Unfortunately, we almost drove these bison to extinction in the late 1800s through overhunting them, especially to reduce food for our indigenous people. Um, but their conservation success story, a few bison got put in captivity um, and then some protections were established for them through the U.S. National Park Service and then they got reintroduced to places like Yellowstone far out west um, and they've been doing their ecological job there for quite a while. But we haven't had them in the tall grass prairie region and especially east of the Mississippi River until they reintroduced bison um, at Natchusa grasslands in 2014. So it was the first time bison had been reintroduced east of the Mississippi River. And obviously the managers at Natchusa were really interested in, um, in potentially increasing the plant diversity but also increasing the heterogeneity of the landscape as bison roam and graze in different areas. And the thought is that that will increase both plant diversity and also animal diversity. But we really don't know about how, we, we don't know how bison are going to impact this community. Um, we have some information about how bison impact um, plant and animal communities in remnant prairie, prairie that's never been plowed. But because this is a restoration site, we have reason to believe as those plants go through these successional stages that the impacts might be a little bit different in our study site at Natchusa. And so I did what any good ecologist would do when I was traveling around with the manager at the site and he was telling me they were getting ready to reintroduce bison in 2012. Um, I called up all my friends who study different taxa and I said, we need to get some before data like immediately. And so that's what we did. Um, we started collecting data at the site in 2013 on a whole host of um, of, of taxa throughout the prairie. Um, and I'm only going to present a few of those taxa today, but just so you know, we do have data on the soil microbial responses to bison, as well as the bee community and reptile community. Okay, so here's a map of the study site. I like to call this place a restoration ecologist playground, and that's because the managers did a few things that um, let us ask these sorts of questions relatively in a re relatively straightforward way. So, um, you can see here that uh, Natchusa Grasslands is in Franklin Grove, Illinois, which is in northern Illinois. We um, took this map footage with our drone, by the way, which I'm very proud of. Um, and what happened when they reintroduced bison in 2014 is that they only reintroduced bison to half of the acreage of the site. So this site is 1,200 hectares and bison have free access to 600 of those hectares. And what you can see here are the study sites that we work in and they're different um, ages, so the, the years that they were restored. And what's cool is there are eight um, sites within the, within the bison unit and seven sites without, and each one of those treatments have a chrono sequence of time since restoration. So we can not only ask questions about bison and no bison, but we can also ask questions about time since restoration and how that interacts with bison impacts, which is awesome. And then we also have before data and after data for before and after bison were reintroduced in these areas. We also have one remnant in each grazing treatment, and again, those remnants have never been plowed. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about four components that we've studied, bison diet, dung beetles, birds, and small mammals. We're going to start with bison diet. And I was specifically interested in understanding um, with this research and as well as my graduate student who was on this project, we really wanted to know what bison were eating, if they really are these grass grazers, if they really do prefer this grass and that they can give that competitive advantage back to the wildflowers, and then do those um, patterns change seasonally. And so to do this, we use stable isotope analysis. Your mom always told you you are what you eat. And um, basically this is an analytical way to sort of put that to the test. So you are what you eat isotopically as well. So if I pulled a hair from any of you and ran it through and got the carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes, I could tell you whether you are a vegetarian, I could tell you whether and how much meat you eat, um, if you do, and then I could also tell you how much your diet relies on corn, which is the C4 grass. And the same is true of bison hair. So every year there's a health roundup check um, where bison get um, checked and then vaccinated. And then the managers will pull some tail hair for me. And what we can do with that tail hair is segment it out and look at how their diet changes seasonally. And what you have to know um, in order to predict proportion of bison diet is um, what the isotopic signatures are of their potential diet items. So we collected a bunch of plants out there that we think they're eating, and then we looked at the ones that were isotopically clustered in certain areas in isotope space. Um, and with that, we used a Bayesian stable isotope mixing model then to predict the, what bison were eating and what proportions. 
And here is what we found. On the y-axis, we have mean proportion of diet, and then we have time, um, and we have samples from May 2016 all the way through October 2017, so about a year and a half of data. Um, and what you can see here is, you know, what should first jump out at you is the C4 grasses, which are these iconic tall grasses of the prairie, things like big blue stem, um, et cetera. And so they're relying mostly on those C4 grasses, which is what we thought they would do. They're basically grass mowers. Um, but I want to point out some, some other spots which are interesting and that we didn't know before. The first one is that there's a pretty high reliance on wetland plants, which are these rushes, sedges, and willows that grow around wetlands, and forbs, um, which are the wildflowers, in fall and throughout winter. And what this looks like on the ground when you're in the field is that these grasses are senescing and they're turning brown. They don't look very delicious, but the wetland plants are staying green and they're, they're pretty green throughout most of the fall slash winter. And so what we think is that those grasses are more delicious to the bison, um, but they probably have more protein in them as well, which might help them store up for uh, the long winter when, when cows are gestating. Another thing I want to point out is that there's a, not, a fairly significant amount of forbs and legumes in bison diet. If you just look at the whole diet, sort of smoosh all of this together, 30% of their diet is actually nitrogen-fixing forbs and other forbs, not grasses. And so what that means is that the hypothesis that bison are going to give the competitive advan advantage back to forbs still might be supported, but it might be more muted than we might have otherwise guessed. And the wetland part is really important, so there's more research going on now to understand if bison are impacting the wetlands and in what way based on the data that we've collected. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so I wanna jump up a trophic level from what plant is happening with plants to what is happening with dung beetles. And um, we wanted to understand if um, dung decomposition, which is a really important ecosystem service, was changed with bison and what was happening with dung beetle abundance and diversity as well. And by we, I mostly mean my collaborator, Nick Barber. This is one of my favorite pictures of him. He's gloriously scooping some bison poop for this research. Um, and we also had a lot of help from undergraduates, uh, such as the one pictured in the middle here. And then Cheryl Hosler did her whole master's thesis on the dung beetle community. Um, and so to, to look at decomposition, what you do is you measure a, a particular amount of dung, you put it out, and then you um, track its weight through time and see how much it's decomposed. To understand the dung beetle community, we have a very high-tech system where we use a plastic solo cup and then a plastic fork, which is baited with bison dung, um, and catch dung beetles and identify them. And here's what we found. Um, dung decomposition, as we hypothesized, is faster in the bison sites, but there's an interesting time since restoration pattern where, where the older ones especially have a lot higher decomposition, as shown here in these black bars, um, through time. And we think that the mechanism for that is that um, dung beetles are much more abundant, as you can see in panel A here, um, in the bison unit than they are outside the bison unit, and that's regardless of fire, which is another treatment here. We also see higher species richness of the dung beetle community in the bison sites. And while this isn't earth shattering, it's really cool to see our hypotheses supported and to see um, changes out there in ecosystem function as bison have been reintroduced. Okay, I wanna jump up another trophic level and talk about grassland birds. So my team and I were really interested in understanding grassland bird nesting success. And by my team and I, I mostly mean Heather Horakovich, who is a former master's and PhD student who spent five summers in the prairie searching for needles and haystacks. So those of you that have worked in grassland birds will be familiar with what I'm talking about, um, but if you're not, the nests of grassland birds are teeny tiny, super hard to find. You can see that tiny egg in Heather's hand there. Um, and so basically what you have to do is walk through the prairie, try to flush birds off of a nest, and then what Heather did was gauge the fate of those nests. And a successful nest would mean um, a, a chick had fledged out of it. And so she found a bunch of nests and we thought that potentially grassland nesting bird success would decrease with bison due to cowbird parasitism. So cowbirds are these really cool birds that lay their eggs in other species nests, they're a nest parasite, and then they allow those other species to raise their young. And the thing about cowbirds is they flock around livestock, hence the name. And we do see a ton of cowbirds flocking around the bison herd um, out at Natchusa grasslands. And so we thought potentially that parasitism would increase. And sometimes if 
a cowbird has paras um, parasitized a nest, that that um, species will just abandon the nest, or it will only feed the cowbird chick and, and their species will fail. Um, so total, Heather found 260 nests and we found, um, she found that 30% of them were successful. But in terms of bison, here's what we found in terms of survival for nests on the y-axis through time. And you can see that the red lines here are in the bison unit, the purple lines are outside the bison unit, and then we have data from before and after bison um, were reintroduced. And so what you see is a, an increase in the probability of survival for all the species nests that Heather searched for the first couple years after bison were reintroduced and then it sort of tapers off a little bit. And we think field sparrows are driving this pattern because they show this pattern and that's most of what Heather found and the mechanisms for this need to be sorted out still. But the good news is that we did not see lower nest success from bison. And in fact, we saw lower cowbird parasitism after bison were reintroduced, despite the fact that we see them flocking around the bison. So that's really interesting. Okay, so last but not least, I want to talk about um, the part of this research that, that my lab has been responsible in that for, and that's the um, small mammal community. So we've looked at um, diversity of the small mammal community, and then, but today I'm going to tell you about functional trait and behavioral differences in the bison unit. Um, and so for, um, for the small mammal work, it's a ton of work. I just want to emphasize that this really is sort of a, a team project. Um, but basically at all of those 15 sites, um, we go out and we trap mammals four times a year for four nights in each site. So you can see a Sherman trap there. These are live traps, which we bait with oats and peanut butter. Um, and we open them at dusk and then check them at dawn. And there are 25 of those traps out at each one of the sites that we're measuring. Um, so we've had a ton of, of data, and that's really important, especially, you know, in ecology in general, we really want long-term data, but it's super important, especially for species like small mammals, which go through these boom and bust cycles, um, where you can't capture what's going on just in a year because you don't know where they are in the boom bust cycles. So we have seven years of data now. To, um, this year should be our eighth year of data collection, but the pandemic obviously has other ideas for us. We have gridded out our sites. You can see us in our masks there gridding this year, just in hopes that we might be able to trap. Um, but even if we don't, we have a lot of data already, over 10,000 trap nights and a whole host of people who have worked on the project, including hundreds of volunteers. Okay, so like I said, we looked at diversity and we don't find any difference in small mammal abundance or diversity, um, but we do find some differences in functional traits like weight. So on the y-axis here, we have um, the weight of the animals and these are sites that had bison uh, reintroduced to them. And you can see that after bison were reintroduced, the mammals are heavier. And this pattern is true even if you compare in the same year, um, the bison site animals to the non-bison site animals. And again, some more mechanistic work needs to happen to understand what's, what's going on, but my best guess is that the, potentially um, there's more sort of nutrient input from the bison leading to more resources for delicious invertebrates for the small mammals to eat, um, or that the bison impacts on plants result in more delicious seeds for the mammals to eat. So um, that's a pretty interesting pattern. And then the other thing that's really cool is the idea that bison can change the perceived predation risk of the small mammal community. So small mammals are down there foraging on the ground, they're nocturnal at nighttime. You can imagine if you were a little mouse and you were trying to go forage at nighttime and there was a full moon, that would be a little scary because there are things like owls and other nocturnal predators that might find it easier to hunt you down. And so we would hypothesize that regardless of bison, that we would find fewer animals on the full moon. And that's what's happening here in this graph. Um, the full moon is, um, is the full moon's at the 100%. And so that's sort of high perceived predation risk. And what you can see is that that's true, but only in the bison unit. So it seems as if the landscape of fear for these small mammals are impacted, but is impacted, but only in the bison unit. And what we think potentially is happening is that the bison are sort of grazing down these otherwise super tall grasses that might protect those small mammal community, even on um, full moon nights, from, um, from being able to be seen by aerial predators and other predators. Um, what's really cool, though, is that other species show the opposite pattern to this. So that what I'm showing you are, uh, is a pattern for deer mice, which is our most commonly caught species out there. 
Um, but other species show the exact opposite pattern of this. And so what we think is happening are some really cool competitive dynamics. And um, obviously we need to do a little bit more work to understand uh, what's happening. And so you should stay tuned for that. Okay. So I've gone through sort of four different types of research and I just wanna sum up here before we get into the Q and A. So what we found for bison diet is that the, their diet shifts throughout the season and that they're not strict grass grazers. And um, that's led to some more research at the site, especially to try to understand what's happening in the wetland sites. But it's also informing the other places where bison are being reintroduced here in the eastern tallgrass prairie region in terms of making sure that the types of habitats that bison um, need or want to thrive in are, are available. So that's pretty cool. Dung beetles um, out in the landscape result in more decomposition in the, in the bison unit and they also have higher abundance and richness as well. We see an increased uh, nest success for the first couple of years after bison are reintroduced um, and the highlight there is that there's not reduced success from cowbird parasitism. And then mammals are heavier in the bison unit and there does seem to be a change in their perceived predation risk and we're going to look further into that. Okay, so there's a ton of things that we've done that I haven't been able to tell you about today. Specifically, we have a fair amount of ecosystem functioning data, including um, decomposition and biomass. We have interactions with fire for pretty much everything we've studied, and we know that bison and fire interact in unique ways because bison love to go graze in recently burned sites. Um, for many of these taxa, we have functional and phylogenetic diversity data, and we're looking at how those patterns change. And then lastly, I just want to plug the work of the postdoc in my lab, Pete Guyton, who's been doing some structural equation modeling to um, ask if the impacts of management are on animal communities are mediated by plants or are directly, um, or if management is directly impacting the animal community. So um, this is a cool way to tie in, tie together all of these data, which is super cool. So stay tuned for that one. And then before I end, I just wanted to mention, so Mark already introduced ecological solutions and evidence, but the work that I've been telling you about is really a collaboration between us and the managers at the site. We're really interested in making sure that we ask questions that are of relevance to the management community. And if that sounds like the type of science that you do, um, or you work with managers and you have managers who are interested in getting some research out there, um, I'd like to plug Ecological Solutions and Evidence. It's an open access journal, so anyone can access it, and you all should check it out. Lastly, we're in a pandemic, and this pandemic is affecting people unevenly. And there's this cool initiative called Publication Partner that is matching people who might have some extra time on their hands to help those that are in need of help get manuscripts um, out the door. So if that's something that you're interested in either volunteering your time for, or if you are struggling right now and need some help, I encourage you to check out the information on this slide. And with that, I'm done. Well, thank you so much, Holly. That was uh, fantastic. Um, I'm just waiting for my video to go live, but we can start right now. Um, amazing response in the, in the Q and A's. Uh, a lot of people are uh, uh, really appreciating your talk and, and really fascinated by this project overall. Uh, a ton of questions, but unfortunately we can only go through a couple. And, and what I will say is um, we will post uh, some of the questions to the beneath the YouTube video, and hopefully Holly will have time to engage with people there as well. Um, so a couple of, of questions, uh, one from uh, Yasin Khan, um, who is currently working on grassland in northeastern China. Uh, uh, and their question is really about what's happening globally uh, with respect to grassland trajectories. Uh, is, is it similar as what's happened and happening in the United States? And what are some of the future projections? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly more well versed in the North American grasslands and I think people working in those other grasslands would be better suited than me to answer that question. Um, grasslands are something sort of I came to by happenstance because I started working in Illinois and when you're someone who's interested in restoration in Illinois, you work in grasslands. 
Um, but grasslands are a really globally threatened ecosystem um, that's well known and so biodiversity all over the planet that relies on grasslands um, isn't doing so hot. So we have a lot of work to do in grasslands and um, I think a lot of people you know that aren't scientists think well we should just plant some trees and that'll be better for the world but I just want to emphasize that tree planting isn't always great um, especially in grassland ecosystems. Hey, um a number of questions about uh, the bison. Um, so for example, Willie Horn and uh, uh, Giulio Biondi um, about whether or not um, they've established well their increasing numbers and how their impacts are comparing to other places where they've been reintroduced. Yeah, so that's a super cool question. Um, they are wanting to keep the herd uh, around 100 animals just to keep um, the pressure similar so that they can do these sort of preliminary types of research to make sure that bison aren't having unintended impacts and that that's the right um, balance. So they try to keep it around 100. We have nine new calves so far this year. Calves are adorable. You saw the picture. Um, and they've established really well. So we have good breeding happening. Um, this is a really unique lineage of bison. It's called the wind cave lineage and they're um, unique because their genetics aren't interspersed with cattle genetics. Um, so it's a meta population and there's trade going on between the different um, places that have this wind cave lineage to make sure that ge genetic diversity is maintained. Um, and in terms of how this compares to other places, so the diet part, it, their diet looks a little bit different than other places that we know um, bison have been reintroduced to. So one example is Conza Prairie. We know a ton about what bison are doing at Conza Prairie because it's a long-term ecological research site in Kansas. Um, but like I said before, that's a remnant, so it's never been restored. And so bison there eat sort of a, a little bit differently than the bison at Natchusa do, and specifically the bison at Natchusa are eating more forbs and nitrogen fixing forbs than um, we've seen in other places, so that's pretty cool. Um, I'm cognizant of time, uh, and there are a lot of great questions, and so hopefully we'll get these to you on the YouTube and you'll be able to respond to some of them uh, later on. Um, with that, I really want to thank you for a fantastic talk, um, and let me just share my screen. All right, um, so thanks again, Holly, that was fantastic. Uh, and that brings uh, today's uh, Ecology Live to a, a close. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it was really a, a, a fantastic number of people and great Q&A. Um, next week at the same time, uh, we'll have our next talk uh, by Enrico uh, Rosende, uh, who's uh, currently at the uh, Pontificia Universidad uh, Catarica. Uh, in Chile, and he'll be explaining how temperature uh, in a warming world uh, affects organisms at different levels of organization. Uh, if you've enjoyed this talk, uh, why not consider joining the British Ecological Society? Uh, find out all that we have to offer uh, to advance your science and your career uh, by looking on our website, and also to see past talks and engage in ongoing discussion, follow ecological, uh, British Ecological Society on YouTube. See you again next Thursday. Thank you.